All right, uh, so this is up. I can see that uh, the live dashboard tells me that it's going. So just bear with us for a second. We got the big green starting button on YouTube. So I don't really know what that means. My guess would be that various digital robots are talking to other digital robots. And now I am being told that I'm live. Fantastic. I'm gonna go ahead and close my YouTube window because it's weird looking at myself in the past. And we'll go straight to uh, how we're gonna do this. All right, cool. So, um, hey, what's going on? Uh, we're gonna run out the clock here for a couple of minutes until we get started, like officially at one o'clock, but I figured that we could just start just to make sure we don't have any problems. Um, this is AP Biology Online Review 2017, Easter Sunday edition. Uh, we're gonna talk about evolution, which is big idea one. Um, and just so that we're all on the same page about how this all works, these first four sessions are basically gonna review the four big ideas of the course. Hopefully, uh, the notion of a big idea of the course is not something totally brand new to you. Um, hopefully, that's something that your teacher has kind of discussed, but the course is organized in these four big ideas. And then the second four sessions are going to deal with um, more application kinds of stuff. We've got a session on hard topics, we've got a session on labs, we've got a session on quantitative skills, and we've got a session, sort of like an end session, which is like test taking tips and cleaning up some stuff. Each session's taught by a different teacher all across the country. And there's also a group of teachers who will help during each one and help moderate what's going on with it um, and sort of explain uh, in the chat what's going on. So if you have questions, you can totally just shoot them into the chat and the moderators who have these wrench icons will just pop on and let you and answer your questions. Um, that's basically the way this is going to work. So cool. Uh, welcome. My name is Dave Knufke. I uh, used to teach this course a lot, but uh, recently I have uh, moved on to other things, but I still jumped at the chance because it's fun to talk about evolution. And uh, I figured I would talk about it today. Why not? Um, if you need to get in touch with me outside of this, you can get me on Twitter. Um, the website that I used to use is still set up, so you can go there and you can get access to all my evolution stuff. I made a copy of the slides from today's uh, conversation and you can get them at that link. All of this stuff is linked down below in the info field as well. Uh, so don't feel like you have to write it down. It's right there for you. And like I said, this is one, this is the second out of eight sessions to a weekend until the weekend right before the exam. So we're just going to keep going. Um, but you can check out the schedule and the schedule of course links to all the sessions and we'll have uh, recordings of all the sessions. And then there's the question submission form. So please do not submit evolution questions on the question submission form at this point. It's a, it's, a, it's a dead item. If you have questions, put them into the, uh, you know, into the chat and the moderators will help you. And also, um, basically I'll help you at the end. If the moderators, uh, if you, if we're getting a lot of questions, the moderators are going to feed these questions into Google doc. So the way this is going to work is that I'm going to talk for a while. Uh, we're going to kind of go through the content related to Big Idea 1, and then at the end, we're going to bang out to a Google Doc, and we'll look at any questions that the moderators have put on there. I'll address those quickly, and we'll go from there. All right, um, so I'm going to start this show. I lose my little stream window here, but I don't anticipate that there'll be any problem. Bear with me while we, go, while we do that. All right, so um, we should be able to see me kind of in the corner and the slide that I just had to start with. All right, so um, cool. Let's do some uh, some operating instructions for this. So the first one is that there is a handout available for you. I know you heard me say that before, but you may be joining us just now. So if you want that handout, you can totally get that by clicking the link down in the info field and get access to it. Um, occasionally, you're going to see questions that, uh, first of all, apologies for that spelling error in questions, but occasionally you're going to see questions from viewers uh, like you. This was questions that kids submitted on the info on the question submission link before like noon today. So um, that's really important for you guys going forward. If you want to get your questions answered for future sessions, you need to use that info form. And I would encourage you to put your questions in there sooner rather than later. Don't wait until the day of the session. Put them in like a week before so that your hosts for the other sessions can get them in to the document as much as possible. Clearly, we've already made our first mistake. Um, mistakes are going to be inevitable here. So Bear with it, all right? Uh, the moderators will help to clean up any of the mistakes that I make um, as well. And of course, you can always talk to me if there's anything I say that confuses you. And then, I mean, the final note that I have for you guys really before we get into it is that 
you run a real risk of thinking that just going to these sessions is enough. Particularly these first four sessions, content review is useful, but it is not what you need in order to do at your best on the AP exam. The AP exam is very much about application of that content. You, you need to know that content in order to apply it to the kinds of situations they'll give you on the exam, but just thinking like you know all the information in what's about to come is going to get you in good stead is absolutely not the case. So you should be attending reviews with your teachers. You should be practicing with items, right? All the free response questions for the last couple of administrations are up on the College Board website. You should be accessing those and trying to answer those. You should be doing all the things that you need to do to study correctly. And we'll talk more about that at the end as well. But I just want to make that note here. This session is not enough. Even if you went to all eight sessions, it's not enough. You're going to need to do more than just that. All right, so let's dive in. So like I said, your questions will be answered. And so we have a couple of questions here at the top. Somebody wrote in and said, why would evolution be so important in biology? And why is it always in the AP bio test? And very similarly, what do we need to know about evolution? Briefly explain each aspect. So um, that's the purpose of today. So let's dive in. We're gonna start with a conversation about natural selection. So let's talk briefly about how natural selection works. The way that I like to think about it is sort of as a cycle of uh, a cyclic process that works through a variety of different dynamics that we see at work in the world. We can start anywhere we want, but we'll start over on the top left with variation. And so the, the bottom line here is that all living things are different from all other living things. Even identical twins have some differences in terms of their genetic makeup. Variation is universal among living things. Um, this was noticed by many people, um, but it was sort of formalized when Darwin was, was coming up with his notion of natural selection. And so you can see like ladybugs, you probably think about ladybugs as all looking the same, but you can totally see from this picture that they're not all the same. That's true for blades of grass. That's true for squirrels. That's obviously true for humans, right? Variation is just a fact of life. Another fact of life is overproduction. We, we, every generation makes more living things than the environment can support. And this of course was known before Darwin as well, um, but it is just another fact of life. And so Darwin noted that because of this, there was going to be competition for resources in the environment. So ladybugs eat aphids. There are more ladybugs born each year than there are aphids to support them. And so the ladybugs are going to have to compete for the aphids. And so as a result, there's going to be differential success among the different ladybugs or any organism, right? Some will eat the, the number of aphids they need in order to survive. Others are, of course, going to die. And actually, most of any generation's living things are going to die. But the survivors get to reproduce. Um, I know this picture is, uh, it's, it's maybe a little bit spicy for what we're talking about today, but there it is, right? Survivors get to reproduce and then this process just repeats itself. That's basically what natural selection is. The notion of different organisms with different variations, some being more successful than others, the ones being more successful surviving and reproducing and then passing on those variations to their offspring and just repeating that process over and over and over again is what natural selection is. It's a very simple concept. I'm sure most of you guys know a lot about natural selection, but we just had to talk about that here at the beginning. It's important to understand that natural selection leads to adaptation among living things. And adaptation is any variation that helps an organism survive in its environment right? That's a really important point. Natural selection is really the only evolutionary process that leads to adaptation. It's also important here to pause and just know that organisms are not evolving to become better adapted in their environment, right? There's no purpose to evolution. They're not doing it on purpose. It just happens because the most successful organisms are the ones who survive and everybody else gets screened out. That's a really important point and that's the thing that we see kids make mistakes on all of the time on the AP exam. Kids thinking that things, uh, that things, kids thinking that organisms evolve for a particular purpose. They don't. They're just, it's just simply the most successful organisms are the ones who get past the evolutionary screening process of the environment and its limited resources. So this is really it, right? But of course, from this comes two major conclusions that Darwin came up with. The first is this notion of common ancestry of all living things. Every living thing on the planet, if you follow it back far enough through evolutionary history, is related to every other living thing on the planet. That's a pretty amazing notion. 
And you should understand that sort of fundamental kind of mind-blowing aspect of it. If that doesn't blow your mind, you're a different kind of person than me, I assume. But we have this idea of common ancestry of living things. All organisms currently on the planet can be traced back in an unbroken chain to the first organism that ever lived on that planet. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later on. The other conclusion that Darwin kind of was staring in the face was this notion of deep history of the Earth, right? That the Earth is super, super old. It's about 4.5 billion years old. It doesn't really matter that you know that because you can't really even conceive of how old that is. Humans obviously live for maybe 100 years if we're lucky. That is considerably, considerably less than this deep history of Earth. But because of that deep history of Earth, we can have this evolutionary process working from generation to generation, driving the adaptation of living things, resulting in the diversity of species that we see on the planet these days. Cool? Nice. So it's always good to have a couple of examples under your hood for evolution or for anything that we talk about in, the, in, in AP Biology. You always want examples because the exam is going to want different examples. We're going to talk about two really classic examples of, of natural selection very, very quickly here. The first is this idea of antibiotic resistance in bacteria. And so you probably know about this, uh, but you know, uh, over time, bacteria have becoming, ha have evolved and have become resistant to different antibiotics. Again, they're not evolving in order to do that. It's just a simple aspect of what comes from the selective environment that they live in. So this is showing two different plates of, uh, where, where you have bacteria grown on the plates and they put discs of different antibiotics on each of these plates. And you can see that the antibiotic sensitive species is being killed off by all of the discs of antibiotics on the plate. But you can see that the antibiotic resistant species is not being killed off by all of the antibiotics on the plate. Some of the antibiotics are not affecting it at all, right? We don't see those clear zones around several of the antibiotics in the antibiotic resistant species. Why is this happening? How is this happening? It's actually pretty simple evolutionary dynamic happening here. Before selection, you could consider all of the bacterial cells as having different amounts of resistance to those antibiotics. But once we apply the antibiotic, right, we've selected only for those individuals who are the most resistant. Those individuals now find themselves in a world of wonder and virtue, and they can totally go crazy, get all the resources they need, they can reproduce, but of course they pass on their antibiotic resistance to their offspring, and so over time the population becomes more and more resistant to antibiotics. If you wanna get more in depth with this, we can look at it kind of in a cartoonish fashion, but a little bit more in depth. Really what's happening here, in particular with penicillin and those classes of antibiotics, is that the antibiotic sensitive bacteria have an enzyme, which you see up on the top part of this picture, that is affected by the antibiotic. You can see the antibiotic is sort of the uh, orange lowercase q shaped molecule that actually goes in and interacts with that enzyme and blocks that enzyme from being able to make cell walls. That's why the bacteria dies off because the bacteria can no longer make cell walls. They basically pop, right? But if you look at the antibiotic resistant bacteria, you can see that their enzyme has evolved so that that antibiotic can no longer interact with that enzyme. And as a result, that enzyme can continue to make cell walls. Pretty simple way that this works, but that's uh, a little bit more in depth. You don't need to get even this in depth in order to really have a good grounding of it, but you certainly don't need to get more in depth than this. So that's antibiotic resistance. And we see this in bacteria because their generation times are incredibly short, right? It's maybe 20 minutes in optimal conditions to go from one generation of bacteria to the next. So over the span of a year, we're going to have thousands of generations of bacteria. That's going to be thousands of times for this natural selection process to occur if antibiotics are present in the environment, which is going to drive that population to evolve resistance very, very quickly. A uh, macro example, right, of big organisms, maybe that we don't see over time as easily. The classic example here is Darwin's finches. Um, so there's a bunch of different finch species on the Galapagos Islands. And this is actually the only example of evolution that Darwin 
offered from the natural world in the origin of species. But this has been studied in depth in the you know, almost 200 years since Darwin. And in particular, work that was done by Rosemary and Peter Grant looking at the medium ground finch on this island in the Galapagos, Daphne Major, has really been foundational. Uh, and over the, from the 1970s onward, this has really served as sort of a big test case showing that evolution, in fact, does occur in a very rigorous experimental way. So without getting too much into it, Daphne Major is a very small island in the Galapagos, but it's also isolated enough from all of the other islands in the Galapagos that the medium ground finches who live on there from generation to generation basically don't leave the island. It's small enough that you can actually capture and tag each of the members of any generation of medium ground finches on the island. And so that's what the Grants have done for years. They've just shown up on the island, they've kind of set up tents, and they've just captured all of the finches on the island over time. And they've just measured them. They've just measured different characteristics. Pretty much it. Really, really simple. But just repeat that process over and over time and you get some interesting data. In particular, here's one example. So it, there was a drought on the island in 1977. And what the Grants noticed was that the beak depth of the surviving birds was statistically significantly deeper, right? It was shifted in a statistically significant way from what the population looked like before the drought. Reasons for this, I'm sure you guys probably can think about many different reasons for this, but one reason could be that survivors with deeper beaks were able to perhaps eat uh, food that was not available to survivors with more shallow beaks. And so they survived in that drought if those crops with the bigger food were the ones that were more drought resistant. They survived, they passed on their genes to their offspring. Um, and so we get this kind of shift in the population over the span of just a couple of years in a notable way. That's another example of natural selection. So just two examples that you guys can have in your pocket, but I would definitely encourage you guys to go out and get at least two more examples that you can bring into the exam as well. A lot of times free response questions are gonna ask you to provide an example. Right? Or they might give you an example, and so the more examples you're familiar with, the more you might be able to recognize a particular example if you're given it. Cool? Nice. So we're gonna move on and talk about evidence of evolution right after I take this sip of water. So obviously any scientific theory is going to have a lot of evidence that supports it. That's what a theory is in the scientific sense. It's not something that's tossed off, right? It's a big unifying concept that explains a huge number of observations. And so we have evidence of evolution, and this evidence of evolution could be the examples that I just talked about, but it could also be other things. In particular, they could support these Darwinian conclusions of common ancestry and deep geological time. So how do we know that things have been around for a long time? Well, we know that pretty easily through things like radioactive decay. So radioactive isotopes have a predictable half-life, and we can use that predictable half-life in order to establish the age of different things, like rocks and fossils and evidence of living things. This is one particular uh, series of decay, right? This is the this is the uranium-235 to lead-207 decay curve. I don't care if you know that. It's just showing you that you can date objects by measuring the ratio of these two different isotopes that you find in them. And based on that, you can establish things like this happy uh, lady, right? This is Sue out in uh, Chicago, right? She's about 65 million years old. How do we know these things? We know this by dating the radioactive isotopes that we find in and around the specimens that we find. And because we know of an old Earth, it starts to explain other things as well. So, for instance, the notion of continental drift, as first proposed by Alfred Wegener, but later, you know, supported by a huge pile of evidence, which I'm not even going to get into here, really talks about how the continents have moved over time. And we can use how those continents have moved over time to explain the patterns of life that we see in things like the fossil record. We can also use it to explain things like biogeography. Alfred Russell Wallace, right, who a lot of you guys probably know independently came up with the same natural selection idea that Darwin did and really should get co-credit for coming up with that theory. He's also famous for having established this notion of biogeographical zones on the planet. That in these zones, the, the species that we see in these zones tend to be more closely related to each other than they are related to other species in other zones of the planet. It's it's sort of a, a, a loose notion, right? There's definitely a lot of different exceptions, but here's a classic example from Australia. 
right? So Australia, if we go back in plate tectonic time, was the first modern continent that separated out from the common mass of all of the continents. And so the mammals that were on that continent diversified really into their own major lineage, which are the marsupial mammals. And the mammals on all the other continents, for the most part, are placental mammals. And this has to do with fundamental ways that they reproduce, right? We're placental mammals. We were all um, stored in a uterus inside of our mothers while we were developing. Marsupials do it a little bit differently, right? The, the, the fetus comes out a little bit earlier and actually moves into a pouch, which is external from the organism. Well, it's at least an external opening. It's not fully external. But... What's cool about this is because Australia has been separate for as long as it has been, there are marsupial mammals on Australia that occupy the same niches that we see placental mammals occupying on the other continents. So there's a marsupial mouse and a placental mouse. There's a marsupial predator like the thylacine, which actually is probably extinct, and there are placental predators. We see this, we see this analogous evolution among different mammal types in these two different places because they've been separated for so long. But that marsupial mouse is more closely related to that thylacine below it than it is to that placental mouse, even though they look so similar. That's this idea of biogeography. Of course, we have the fossil record as well, and I'm sure that the fossil record is pretty obvious to you guys how that supports the notions of deep history of life and common ancestry. But I'll also point out that the fossil record gives us evidence of transitional forms and evidence that organisms go extinct over time. So we see things like trilobites that wind up going extinct by 250 million years ago. They're all over the fossil record before then. And then after 250 million years, we don't see them again. But we do see organisms that descend from them, other arthropods, insects, horseshoe crabs, things of that sort, that phylum of organisms. Like I said, we have the transitional fossils as well. So um, we have you know, different transitions in the evolutionary history of life. How did we go from living in the ocean to living on land? Well, there's a variety of transitional forms. A particularly famous one is Tiktaalik, right? Which is sort of that fish to land-based tetrapod evolution, which is about 375 million years old. We have, of course, famous, I'm sure you guys know, this is Archaeopteryx, which is showing us the transition from dinosaurs to birds at 150 million years ago. And we have, of course, the transitions from apes, other species of apes, to humans about 4 million years ago. This, for instance, is the famous Australopithecus fossil Lucy. Uh, you guys are probably familiar with all these, but notice these time progressions. The fact that we can use radioactive dating and other methods in order to establish how old these fossils are gives us a really complete history of life and shows us the common ancestry linkages between living things. It would be weird if we went to rocks that were 500 million years old and we started to find humans, right? We shouldn't find humans before about 4 million years ago in the fossil record, give or take a couple of million years. You go back hundreds of millions of years, you shouldn't find any mammals. And if you did, that would really call into question the theory of evolution. But we don't find those things. We don't find incongruities in the fossil record. That's incredibly powerful evidence for the notions of common ancestry and deep history of all living things. We can also get evidence for evolution from morphology, and biochemistry. So by looking at the structures that are present in modern day organisms, we can see if they're related to each other and how they might be related to each other. This, for example, is the tetrapod arm that we see uh, three different versions of. We see our human arm where we have the one bone, two bones, and five fingers. We see how that has been adapted in dogs, but it's still one bone, two bones, and then five fingers. And we see how it's been adapted in birds. Birds have actually lost a couple of their fingers, but it's still that one bone, two bone, wristy bones, and five fingers thing. The fact that all of these organisms have this underlying structure tells us that they're relatively closely related to each other. This is an example of what we would, of what we would call a homologous structure. These are structures that we find in a common ancestor. So the common ancestor of all of these organisms had a limb, one bone, two bones, bunch of little blobs, and some digits. And then that has been adapted over time for divergent functions, right? In us, it's really good for throwing things. Whales, it's really good for swimming around. Birds, it's really good for flying. But we can use these things in order to start to establish how these organisms are related to each other. Uh, this is a really rough 
phylogenetic tree showing the relationships between these four organisms, but it's just to get that point that we can use these structures in order to establish these relationships. Of course, we see other kinds of structures as well. Analogous structures are sort of the opposite, right? So these are structures that do the same thing in different organisms, but evolved independently as a function of these organisms filling similar niches. So I have a pterodactyl skeleton and then a bat skeleton and then a bird skeleton and the wings in each one of them are fundamentally different. Um, they have fundamentally different structure, right? You can see in a pterodactyl, it's hung off of the, off of the, the arm and the foot. Um, in bats, it's hung off of the fingers and the foot. And in birds, we, uh, you can't see it here, but if you go back to that previous picture, you can see that it's really just hung off of the arm, period. That's an analogous structure, totally different underlying structure, but helps all of these organisms fly around because they all evolved in to fill similar niches. Does that make sense? I hope it does. If it doesn't, leave some questions in the comments and um, the moderators will, will clean up anything that I may have left behind. But we must press on. Another piece of evidence that we could talk about here is comparative biochemistry. So this is the idea that DNA, RNA, protein sequences that are present in a common ancestor change over time. So what we see here is we see a speciation event, and we'll talk more about that later taking this common ancestor and leading to these two other species. And then over time, these species starting to evolve away from each other. And so as a result, we see changes in their nucleic acid sequences, which I've highlighted here in red. The bottom line here, and this is really important, the longer that two organisms are evolving away from each other, the more changes in their sequences that we would expect to see. Of course, you can do it very easily here, but when you start to compare many, many different species, it's really, really hard to do. You need to start using a computer in order to find all of these differences that have occurred, in this case, in um, amino acid sequences in a particular protein, right? But by putting together this biochemistry information and this morphology information and this fossil information, we wind up getting to this notion of phylogeny. And we'll talk a lot more about phylogenetic trees in a little bit, but that's really how we start to get these kinds of diagrams where we can arrange all of these different species and see how they're evolutionarily related to each other. Another piece of evidence that supports evolution is this idea of artificial selection. So artificial selection is any time that we drive the evolution of an organism. So natural selection, the environment and the requirements of the environment are what are screening for successful organisms. In artificial selective situations, it's humans that are doing the screening for, for successful organisms. So they're not really becoming more adapted, they're really just becoming more useful to us. So these are a bunch of different varietals of carrots um, that were really, I think, essentially just bred because people like different colored carrots. We see this, of course, in other species as well. You may have a furry friend at your house who is definitely the product of artificial selection. These are uh, fancy pigeons that people have bred for different traits over time. Um, and uh, it's, it's another good example of it. Really, any organism that humans use that they don't go out into the wild and hunt is the product of generations of artificial selection. And of course, we now have a lot of different evidence of observed evolution in action. And that all helps to support this overarching theory of evolution. We should talk a little bit about specific evidence for common ancestry. So all of the stuff that we were just talking about is evidence for common ancestry. But we should talk, there's another pile of stuff that really helps to support this idea of the universal common ancestry of all living things, what we refer to as LUCA, right? The last universal common ancestor of all of the life on the planet. How do we know that this is in fact the case? Or I should say, because we don't really know it in that sense, why do we think very strongly that this is the case? We're gonna talk about really deep universal characteristics of living things here. The first, of course, is that all of life is cellularly organized. I mean, excluding viruses, we don't need to get into the whole, are viruses alive or not thing, right? We see three major domains of life. Two of those domains of life are functionally prokaryotic. Um, and one of those domains of life is eukaryotic. And we basically break that up into plant-like and animal-like 
cells that comprise our eukaryotes. I'm not going to get into cellular anatomy here outside of how it supports the notion of common ancestry. Um, so obviously you want to go and check maybe Mr. Kuhn's session from yesterday. You can check all the other resources that we're going to link you guys to. And if you still have questions, bring them up. But we're just going to talk about these cellular characteristics in terms of how they support the common ancestry of all living things. So we have our prokaryotes, bacteria and archaea, um, roughly speaking. And then we have our eukaryotes, which wind up in their own domain of life. But all of life on the planet is cellularly organized, powerful evidence for common ancestry among all living things. Um, this is just to scale, in case you wanted to see the scale difference between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Other deep, deep fundamental things about living things. All cells process information in the same way. All cells basically store their genetic information as DNA, which is transcribed into RNA and then is interpreted in three base segments of RNA as codons into the different amino acids that go into proteins. And they all use the same genetic code. There are a couple of weirdo uh, bacteria that have minor exceptions, but that's, these are not major exceptions. And so that's really cool for a lot of different reasons. I mean, for one, I can take a gene for human insulin, put it in bacteria, and bacteria can make human insulin for us to use. But for us, for our conversation right now, that's an incredibly powerful piece of evidence that supports common ancestry among all living things. The fact that they all use the same genetic language, in quotes, in order to make their proteins and store their information. We see this metabolically as well, right? All cells have common common biochemistry. So this is uh, glycolysis, right? Which is a universal process for releasing energy that we find in all cells on the planet. As far as I'm aware, I can't think of any cells that don't use this process as at least the first step in their uh, energy releasing pathway uh, when they have biological uh, organic molecules to get it from. So again, the fact that we see it in everything really supports the notion that it was present in that universal common ancestor and then moved out from there. We also see that all cells have common um, biochemistry in terms of the forms of biological molecules that they use. We don't need to worry too much about this, but when you're making complex organic molecules, you can have two different mirror image versions of these. There could be the L version and the D version of these things. And you can't they're, fun, they're, they're inverted from each other, right? Like when you look at a mirror, the right is the left and the left is the right. You can't take you and your mirror image and superimpose them on each other because your hands will be on opposite ends, which would be traumatic and horrible. And so what we find in looking at living biochemistry is that all cells use the L form of the amino acids in their proteins and the D form of the sugars, which means that there's no cells on the planet that use the opposite which again supports this notion that these were all present, these preferences were all set up in our common ancestor before they wound up diversifying into all the life that we see on the planet today. Um, cells, of course, we see common ancestry at every branch in life's tree. Um, so just looking at the eukaryotes, because they're a little bit more uh, perhaps interesting than the prokaryotes in terms of their cellular anatomy, we see our plant-like and animal-like eukaryotes. They probably look somewhat different just looking at them. There are obvious differences, but there are also common eukaryotic organelles that we see in both, right? So there's a nucleus that we see in both, which I've circled here in red. They both have ribosomes, which they use to make their proteins, and they're both similarly structured in terms of the size of their ribosomal subunits. We, they've both got an endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, they both have Golgi apparatus. I didn't circle these. They both have mitochondria, which we'll talk more about a little bit later on, why they both have mitochondria. And they both, of course, have a cytoskeleton. The fact that all of the eukaryotic cells on the planet share all of these common organelles helps to establish this notion that they were probably present in the last universal common ancestor of all the eukaryotes. I guess the leuca, I suppose, um, would have all of those organelles in it before it branched out into all the different cell types that we see on the planet today. Cool? Nice. So um, we're about, uh, I would say we're about 40% through this right now. So hang in there, friends. All right. You guys are doing great. If you need a pause, you can always hit that pause button and pause it and then come back to it. Cool? Nice. So we're going to move on. We're going to talk about cladistics and phylogeny, um, which was uh, something that was asked for, right? So somebody wrote in and wanted to know how we can create a phylogenetic tree or a cladogram from DNA and protein sequences. We want to know how we can draw a cladogram. And somebody wrote in to ask how phylogenetic trees work. And then somebody wrote in and just said cladistics. 
So let's talk about these. For your purpose, cladistics and phylogenetic trees are the same thing. They're not technically the same thing, but it's not something you need to worry about. And a cladogram and a phylogenetic tree are the same kind of structure, all right? Um, technically, a phylogenetic tree is based on evolutionary relatedness, and a cladogram could be based on anything that organisms have in common or anything has in common. You can make a cladogram out of shoes if you wanted. It's not any big deal. We're not going to actually draw a phylogenetic tree in this session. If you want help drawing a phylogenetic tree, you should definitely put that on the question submission form so that it can be dealt with in the complex topics, the quantitative skills, or the test tips section of this. We're just gonna talk about how to interpret a phylogenetic tree. So let's make sure we're all on the same page. This is uh, the famous I think tree diagram from Darwin's notebook. And this, as I showed before, is the only diagram that was in the first edition of the Origin of Species, and it's it's a phylogenetic tree. So what we have here, and they all look the same, although they won't all be as pretty as this, is that we have time, it's generations of time, and then we have different organisms which are represented here as different letters on the chart with rev with relatedness being shown in terms of the, the letters of the alphabet that they have in common. We have a common ancestor down at the bottom, which is not being shown here. And when we look at this tree, right, up at the top, in this case, we have the species that are still alive. And throughout the tree, we have a variety of species who have died off. They are no longer with us, which is, of course, the most common fate of all living things. That's how we interpret a tree. Most of the trees that you look at will be rotated 90 degrees clockwise. So the extant species will be all the way to the right and the common ancestor will be all the way on the left, but they all function in the same way. So how do we make a tree? Well, we need to pick the right characteristics in order to do it. And so we need to pick data that's useful what are called shared derived characters, characteristics that are shared among organisms and are a result of them being derived from their common ancestor. So a cool example of this would be like circulatory systems in mammals and fish and other vertebrates. Um, and they all we all have similar circulatory systems with some fundamental differences. So fish have a two-chambered heart and mammals have a four-chambered heart. And so we can use that evolution of a four-chambered heart to help us understand the when the mammal lineage diversified from the fish lineage. Uh, but it's really important when you're doing this to avoid analogies. So like, for instance, uh, fish and whales don't have legs, right? I mean, I hope that's not news to you guys, but they don't have legs because of analogous evolution not because their common ancestor didn't have legs and then they both derived from that common ancestor and kept their no legs. Uh, whales, of course, are mammals. So whales got legs and then lost them again as they moved back into the ocean. Um, it, that's just, you know, kind of the fundamentals of how this works. Um, so you want to not pick the kind of characteristics that could lead you astray. The, the organizing notion here is this idea of maximum parsimony, which is this idea that a trait or a mutation only occurs once and is then passed down to all of its all the descendants of that organism, unless there's other evidence to suggest otherwise. So um, like mammals and birds both have a four-chambered heart, but we have very clear evidence that the common ancestor of mammals and birds did not have a four-chambered heart, that it had a three-chambered heart. It was a reptile or something like a reptile. And we know that reptiles have three-chambered hearts. So mammals and birds both evolved a four-chambered heart, but they evolved them separately from each other. If we just went with the four-chambered heart in this case, we might think that they share a more recent common ancestor than they do. But we have a lot of other evidence that helps us understand that in this case, it's an analogous evolutionary situation. So um, the coin of the realm in determining phylogenetic relationships these days is essentially molecular data, right? It would be really weird to build a modern phylogeny and not use DNA sequences or RNA sequences or protein sequences in order to do it. At the same time, you're going to need that fossil record information, that morphological data in order to help us date when lineages diverged apart from each other. You can't just figure that out based on the molecular data that you get in a tree. And so 
Once uh, molecular data sequences are determined, uh, computer programs are used to align these sequences and figure out the most likely ways that these sequences change from species to species. So we have a possum, dog, and bear in this case, and I turn this into a phylogenetic tree here. And so we can see that the possum and the uh, dog are slightly more related to each other than the dog and the bear are in this case. Uh, I don't actually think that's actually true, but we can say they're all pretty different from each other. Um, so how do we read this tree? Well, our common ancestor is somewhere back here. We're not showing it. This is technically what we would call an unrooted tree, but you don't need to worry too much about that. And then we have the length of these different branches, and that length has some sort of indicator. So each branch connects at a node to a common ancestor, and then those, all of the branches and the common node are referred to as a clade. And we get some indicator of distance. So in this case, I believe, if memory serves, that space on a horizontal branch is equal to a 2% likelihood that any one base in the, pro, in, the, uh, in the gene, in the DNA sequence, has been changed from one, from one of these organisms to the next. And I think they've totaled that up and put that up on the top of each of these horizontal branches. We could totally make this tree just by putting those three branches without any vertical distance. The vertical distance is not important here. All right, the vertical distance is really just to help us understand the tree and see what's going on. The horizontal difference in this case, or the horizontal distance is what's important. That's the only thing that tells us about relatedness. And so we can see different trees and they can be written in different ways. So now we've totally flipped that. Right, we've gone back counterclockwise 90 degrees. And here we can see now it's the vertical distance that's important and the horizontal distance is just what's separating out. You've probably seen two different ways to draw trees with this sort of um, diagonal lines or with these straight lines. It really doesn't matter which one you use. If you're going to be asked to do this on the AP exam, either they're going to give you a tree and ask you to put the species that they give you onto that tree based on the differences in distance that they have, in which case you're gonna to have to know both versions because you might get one or the other, or they're gonna ask you to draw your own tree and you can draw either one that you want um, as long as it's correct and people will get it. These two trees are exactly the same tree. They're just drawn in different ways. Um, and what's important to understand is that these two trees are exactly the same tree as well because the total amount of distance between any two species hasn't changed just because I've swapped that node on the top left, right? These two trees are totally equivalent trees. Any two trees where you can swap those nodes and still get the same distance between species are going to be equivalent trees. So it's important to understand that when you're drawing trees as well, that you have some, you have some options the way that you do it and still wind up with the same tree. It's also important to understand that phylogenetic trees are hypotheses. So don't worry about what these four different groups of organisms are, um, but it would be cool, I mean, if you want to go here, I mean, you know, go Wikipedia it up, figure it out, and, uh, you know, let people know in the comments if you want what these, what these different organisms are actually. Uh, picks or didn't happen, I suppose. But you have six different possible tree arrangements for these organisms, and each of these trees is a different tree. You can see that in each case, we haven't just swapped a node, we've swapped different relationships. Each one is a different hypothesis about the evolutionary relationships between these different organisms. And the way that we know if they work or they don't is by testing them, by going out and gathering more information, by using that information to continue to revise our trees. And so we'll totally see that over time, our understandings of phylogenetic trees among organisms are changing. It's just the way that this process works. Um, you know, that's what we mean when we say they're hypotheses. A hypothesis is always open for revision as we get more and more information to inform our picture of things. Cool? Nice. So we're going to move on. We're going to talk a little bit about the mathematical understanding of evolution. Sort of the modern version of evolutionary theory. Let's do it. All right, so um, we need to talk briefly about this idea of the modern synthesis. You know, Darwin does his thing. He writes his book. He dies. He doesn't know anything about genetics, modern genetics at all. The next hundred years, people come on the scene. Modern genetics totally develops and explodes. And so 
we have to take our Darwinian understanding of things and connect it to our modern genetic understanding of things. And so that all together is known as the modern synthesis. We're not gonna talk a lot about genetics here, but we are gonna get some terms in here because we can't have this conversation without it. So again, it in our big idea three session, I know there'll be a lot more genetics. And if you want more than that, you can definitely put it on the form. But for right now, here's the genetics that we're going to need to know. I'm sure all of you guys probably know this already, but how is genetic information transmitted? Genes are kept as sequences of DNA uh, in an organism's genome. Any particular sequence of DNA could be referred to as a gene. We're not going to worry too much about it. For our purpose, we're going to focus on the genes that actually evoke phenotypes in organisms. Those genes are transcribed into RNA sequences in organisms. Those RNA sequences are then translated into protein sequences. Proteins are then what give rise to the traits that we see in an organism, what we refer to as phenotypes. In this case, I've said that this hypothetical example is resulting in brown eyes in these smiley organisms. Of course, we know it's not this simple, but for our purpose, it can totally be this simple of a model to use. Um, the environment also plays a major role in this, but we're not gonna pay attention to the role of the environment in our conversation in terms of determining phenotypes. We'll pay attention to the role of the environment in terms of determining evolutionary success and fitness. We know that we have different versions of a gene. So we can have two different or three different or as many different versions of a gene as we want. Those are referred to as alleles. In this incredibly simplified or uh, smiley model that we're using here, the big B allele would code for the brown eye phenotype. This would make, this would be the dominant trait. What we mean by this is that organisms can have two big Bs or they can have a big B and a little B and they'll both show that dominant phenotype of brown eyes. That's what dominant means when we use the term. It doesn't mean better or stronger. It just means that in the heterozygous condition where there's a big B and a little B, the dominant phenotype is the one that shows up. Um, we also have another allele, the little b allele, which codes for blue eyes. The genotype there is going to be little b, little b, and we're going to say that's recessive because you need to be little b, little b in order to have blue eyes. The idea that we use here is saying that the genotype of an organism determines its phenotype. Again, I totally understand that that's oversimplified. I totally understand that this eye color example is oversimplified. Not important. Don't focus on the fact that these are oversimplifications. Focus on the fact that these oversimplifications help us get a robust understanding of how this process works. So because of all of this, we're going to need some new ideas. The first idea that we're going to need is this idea of a gene pool. So here are all of our smiley organisms. What are all of their alleles? Well, that's the gene pool. It's all of the alleles in the population. So I've gone ahead and turned all of these smiley organisms into their alleles. If we look at this and we line it all up, we get something that looks like this, right? Here's our original population. And you can see that here at generation one, the frequency of big B alleles is 15 out of 40. You can, you can count them up if you want. And it's 0.375. And the frequency of little B alleles is 25 out of 40 or 0.625. Yeah? Okay, cool. So now let's look at what's going to happen to this population over the next couple of generations. Here's generation two. Well, we've got a little bit of shifting in our phenotypes of smileys, and we can see that our frequencies of alleles have changed. Here's generation three, and we see that we've got a shift again, and we can see that the frequency of alleles have changed again. Let's go ahead and let's graph this out. Oh, all right, well, here they are again. Let's go ahead and let's graph this out, and we can see what it looks like over time. We can see that the frequency of the different alleles are changing over time. In the modern synthesis version of evolution, that is is the definition of evolution. Evolution is simply just a change in a population's allele frequencies over time. Is this natural selection? Maybe, but because we're now broadening our definition of evolution, we have other evolutionary forces as well that could be driving the kinds of changes that we see in this population of smileys over time. Um, one quick thing to point out here is notice that it's a change in a population's allele frequencies over time. That means that individuals can't evolve, right? It's a population level phenomena. It's only through looking at the changes in the overall gene pool over time that we can figure out whether or not evolution is occurring. Of course, we can't get through the math without talking a little bit about Hardy-Weinberg, but just to be clear, here in our discussion, we're just gonna talk about what it means 
how we derive it, and how different factors in the environment affect whether or not a population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. I know I'm going to be disappointing some people out there when I say that we're not going to solve any Hardy-Weinberg problems in this session. Um, Mike Ralph in the quantitative skills has already committed to solving some Hardy-Weinberg problems. So make sure that you tune in for that. It's already on his radar. You don't need to ask him to do it again. But he's not going to go through what I'm about to go through. He's not going to go through this derivation and all the factors and how it affects it. We're going to be like, we're going to kind of like tag teaming this, right? We're going to take two different sides of this and go through it. So let's dive in. Hardy and Weinberg, there they are. They came up with this notion independently of each other, which is kind of cool. And there's two equations for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, both of which are on your formula sheet, which you'll have on the exam. You've got your gene pool equation, which is P plus Q equals one. And you have your genotype equation, P squared plus two PQ plus Q squared equals one. The Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium describes a population that is not evolving. So the frequency of alleles in the population are not evolving over time. They're not changing. Let's look at what this means. Here's our smileys again. We've got our different phenotypes. We've got our different alleles. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna say that the dominant allele, big B, the one that gives you brown eyes, we're gonna, sig uh, we're gonna signify as P, right? So P is going to be the frequency of the dominant allele and Q is going to be the frequency of the recessive allele. Of course, in this kind of situation where there's only two alleles, the total frequency of P plus the total frequency of Q, if you add it all up in the gene pool, it has to equal one, right? Just remember, frequencies are simply the uh, decimal version of fractions or percentages, right? That's, that's all a frequency really is for our purpose here. So P plus Q has to equal one. One in this case is equivalent to 100%. Of course, it's not that quite that simple when we look at genotypes. There's actually three different genotypes, if you remember to what we talked about before. You could be big B, big B, in which case you're homozygous dominant. You could be big B, little b, in which case you're heterozygous. Or you could be little b, little b, in which case you are homozygous recessive. So for the genotype version of the equation, big B, big B is going to be symbolized as P squared. And I'll show you how we derive that in a second. Big B, little b is 2PQ. And little b, little b is Q squared. Let's, look, let's go and look at how we figure these things out. If we remember how organisms that sexually reproduce are reproduced, we have a male and a female. That male has two different possible alleles. That female has two different possible alleles in most cases, certainly in our little simplified eye color case. And so if we look at all the combinations that we can possibly have, we have the male up on the top doing either giving a P or a Q, and the female also either giving a P or a Q. So what are the odds that you would get a P from both? Algebraically, that's expressed as P squared. What are the odds that you would get a Q from both? Algebraically, that's expressed as Q squared. And then what are the odds that you would get a P from one and a Q from the other? Well, you could get a P from mom and a Q from dad, or you could get a P from dad and a Q from mom. Both of those are algebraically expressed as P, Q. So when you put all this together, these are your four possible choices. P squared plus our two PQs plus our Q squared equals one. If we're looking at the different genotypes here, we can see that our P squared is the frequency of brown-eyed individuals in the environment. Our two PQ are the heterozygous in the environment and our Q squared are the homozygous recessive individuals in the environment. Add it all up equals one. Again, we're not gonna go in and solve it. That's gonna be at a later session, but I hope that this helps you understand why it is the way that it is. Of course, if it doesn't, feel free to ask some questions in the sidebar. So we have some other questions that came in over the question submission form. One was, what are the differences between natural selection, genetic drift, gene flow, etc.? cetera? Uh, we had, how does genetic drift work and how does it affect speciation? Um, and we have, how does genetic drift work? So we're gonna go in and talk about each of these. And we're gonna talk about them through the lens of this idea that no real population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. There are five major factors that are keeping populations, natural populations from being in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Remember, a population is only in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium when it is not evolving. Every real population on the planet is evolving in some way. And there are really five major ways that a population can evolve. We have natural selection, of course, we have sexual selection, which we'll talk about a little bit. We have genetic drift, which I, you guys saw was a pretty common question. We have gene flow and we have mutations. So we'll go through each one and we'll explain how the Hardy-Weinberg theoretical population accounts for each one. 
So natural selection is just due to a change in the environment. If the environment changes, you're going to have natural selection working on the population. It is a, a fact of living in a changing environment. So in a hardy Weinberg population, what we say is that the the environment is totally stable from generation to generation. Same amount of food, same amount of space, all of that stuff never changes. Of course, that's not the real world, but in the real world, things evolve because of natural selection. We need to have a completely stable environment for a population to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. We have no sexual selection in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So, um, you know, uh, yeah, I don't know what to tell you really. Some organisms are more likely to reproduce with other organisms. Mates have preferences. Um, you know, it is what it is. Um, and so that mate preference, the fact that you have mates that have preferences and what they're looking for means that some organisms are going to be more likely to reproduce than others are. It's just kind of the way that it goes, so to speak. So mate preference leads to sexual selection. That's what sexual selection is. It's, uh, it's evolution that we see as a result of preferences and mates. A classic example of this is the male peacock's tail, which is like kind of maladaptive if you think about it. And the male peacock has to have this big tail and has to live in the environment with like predators out there with this gigantic tail. But female peahens prefer to mate with males with ornate tails. Maybe it's an advertisement that they're fit, that they can survive in the environment even though they have this ridiculous thing on their butts. But that's and that's an example of sexual selection. Because peahens prefer males with ornate tails, we get males with more and more ornate tails. The more ornate tail you have, the more likely you are to reproduce. In order to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, you can't have this, right? No population can be undergoing sexual selection. So for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we have to say that there's completely random mating, that any individual in the population has as much time or as much chance as any other individual of reproducing with each other. A Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium population also has no genetic drift. So genetic drift was a question that came up a little bit here. Genetic drift is simply the chance fluctuations in alleles from generation to generation, not due to selection by the environment. Um, you know, sometimes organisms are just unlucky, so to speak. They get hit by cars. Um, they get hit by meteorites. They freeze to death when the, when the weather goes down because they're caught outside. The volcano erupts, whatever. Right. If you're unlucky, you're not being selected against, really. Right. You're just kind of being removed um, just due to the to the to the somewhat random nature of the universe. And so as a result, the population's allele frequencies can change from generation to generation just due to these chance events. That's what genetic drift is. Genetic drift has a bigger effect on smaller populations, because if I remove one individual from a population of 10 individuals, I'm removing 10 percent of the alleles. But if I remove one individual from a population of 100 individuals, I'm only removing 1% of the alleles. Even if I removed five individuals from the population of 100 individuals, I'm still removing only 5% of the alleles, whereas all I would have to do is take out one from my population of 10 and remove twice as many of the alleles. The larger the population is, the less an effect that chance events are going to have in terms of genetic drift. My example here are uh, elephant seals, which have uh, substantially reduced genetic diversity because their population was extensively hunted by humans. And again, it wasn't really selected against. They were just unlucky that they happened to be big and delicious and available for organisms for, you know, humans to hunt. And they were almost hunted to extinction. So that population was greatly reduced in size. And then all of the descendants of that population, they're now a protected species, have come from that original group of individuals. That's actually an example of a genetic drift phenomenon known as the bottleneck effect, when some sort of catastrophic event removes a bunch of those individuals and then those survivors give rise to a new population. That's a classic example of genetic drift. Um, the other example, and you can look this up if you want to see how it works, is what's known as the founder effect. It's very, very similar. It's just that the, bot the bottleneck isn't due to some sort of event in nature. It's just due to a group of individuals winding up being isolated from everybody else. The bottom line here is that a Hardy-Weinberg population needs to be large. It needs to be large enough so that genetic drift cannot have an effect on the population. We have no gene flow, right? No immigration or emigration, because obviously if individuals move into or out of a population, that's going to affect allele frequencies. So uh, these two individuals were married at one point and they had a child. I'll let you guys uh, do the work if you want to figure out who that child is or who these people are, but it's definitely worth a dive in. Um, and that's a good example of gene flow, right? These individuals came from populations that 
it, historically were probably really separated from each other. It probably would not have been likely for individuals from these two populations to get together. But in the modern age, it was as trivial as kind of taking a plane. Right. And then I guess, you know, going out for dinner and so forth. But so that's gene flow. When individuals go from one population to another population, they take their alleles with them and then they bring them into that new population. You can't have that if you want to be not evolving. So in a Hardy Weinberg population, there's no immigration or emigration of individuals. And then, of course, there have to be no mutations, right? Mutations are just changes in alleles. The lobster is blue because it has a mutation. You can't have mutations because you're going to change alleles when you do. And for a Hardy-Weinberg population, that would be evolution. So you can't, that, that can't happen. So a Hardy-Weinberg population has no net mutations. So those are the five characteristics of a population that's in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. No natural selection, right? Completely stable environment, large population, random mating, no immigration or emigration, and no mutations are the big five that we need to see that drive evolutionary pressure. So the question might be, well, if it's not used, why is it useful? There's two ways that it's useful. The first is that you can compare real population data to what you calculate using the Hardy-Weinberg population equations, and that can help you to get some ideas about how different evolutionary pressures may be affecting that population. Is it just fluctuating back and forth, back and forth, back and forth? Maybe it's more of a genetic drift than it is any sort of selection that's driving that evolution. Or do we see some sort of directed changes in these frequencies over time? In that case, that might tell us that selection is occurring. The other thing is that real populations can approximate Hardy-Weinberg populations. So they might not be perfectly in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, but from generation to generation, slow evolving populations can, uh, are not changing so much that it's not useful to figure out sort of, to use the Hardy-Weinberg equations to figure out what the possible incidences are of particular alleles in the population. We do that a lot in trying to figure out the incidences of certain alleles in the human population, particularly alleles related to diseases. If you ever see any of those uh, frequency calculations, those can be done using Hardy-Weinberg uh, uh, equilibrium equations. So I hope that that helps give you some grounding on what Hardy-Weinberg is and why it's useful. We're going to move on and talk about speciation. I can see that we're coming up to the end of our hour. I'm not going to stop, all right? So I'm just going to go on through this. We're about two-thirds of the way done. Um, so it looks like we're going to bring this in about 2.30. Um, but, you know, you can always take a break, come back, leave your questions. You can leave them in the comments afterwards and I'll get them, right? So don't, don't, don't feel like you have to sit here through the whole thing. But let's go in and let's talk a little bit about speciation. The first thing to talk about with speciation is probably to understand the way that selection can affect different populations. So we can have a situation where before the selective event, we have a variety of different phenotypes. And afterwards, we've kind of moved against the extremes. That's what we call a stabilizing selection event. We could see what we call a directional selection event, where before we have um, a distribution that's towards one end of the extreme, and afterwards we get a distribution towards the other end. Or we can have the, pardon me, the disruptive selection event, where we select sort of against the most common and towards the extremes. These are the three major ways that selection can lead can drive the uh, distribution of a phenotype in a population, which kind of connects us to this notion of speciation, right? The biological species definition, which is a group of individuals that can successfully reproduce. So here I have three different um, individuals. Can any of them successfully reproduce with each other? Actually, no. These are three different species of individuals. They're all reproductively isolated from each other. We've got a chimpanzee, we've got a bonobo, and then we have a human being over on the right. Um, and so even though that human being is, you know, adorable and horribly cute, uh, you know, he's never going to be able to reproduce with a chimpanzee or a bonobo. And neither will the others. It just doesn't work that way because they are biological species. So how does this happen? How do we get a population that's reproductively isolated from each other? The way we do that is through an event known as an allopatric speciation event or through an event known as a sympatric speciation event. Let's look at each of these in turn. So allopatric speciation is probably the easiest one to get your head around. You get some sort of geographic barrier that winds up separating the two populations for a prolonged period of time. And once those two populations are separated for a prolonged period of time, they can wind up evolving on their own. So we wind up seeing things like maybe our population on the right starts to evolve in a different way. And so, now we have enough genetic difference over this time so that when those populations come back together, they are 
they're significantly different from each other. And so they can no longer reproduce with each other because they are now separate species. Cool? Nice. The other version is a sympatric speciation event. So the point here is that you do not need to physically separate populations in order for them to speciate. You can have events that occur within a contiguous population that drive the sympatric speciation event, like you see here. We're getting the same speciation event, but not because the populations are separated from each other. We had a question about that, right? Which relates to allopatric and sympatric speciation. When we say gametic isolation or any other types of isolation, what speciation do you refer to? Allopatric or sympatric? The answer is it depends. It totally depends. It doesn't matter. Both, right? One or the other, both. I mean, I don't really know a better answer to give you here because all of those barriers relate to speciation. Species barriers are the things that prevent two different species from reproducing with each other. So here we have a zygote, right? This is the fertilized egg that is the product of fusion of sperm and egg coming together, right? It's the first diploid cell in any sexually reproducing organism. What prevents that from happening? All of these things can prevent that from happening. The organisms can be isolated from each other because they don't live in the same area. That's they can be isolated from each other because they behave in certain ways. Their mating dances could be different. They could be isolated because the parts don't fit together, right? Flower, floral anatomy might not fit together in order to allow for cross-pollination among different species. And they can be isolated from each other because proteins on the surface of the sperm and the egg do not allow for those two cells to fuse together to make the zygote. All of those things on the left of your screen are pre-zygotic barriers. They prevent the zygote from forming. But even after the zygote forms, we can have all sorts of post zygotic barriers where the hybrid that's produced isn't fit. Maybe it's not even born, right? But maybe it's born and it's just maladapted for the environment. These are the post zygotic barriers that we see in hybrids. All of these together are species barriers. All of them can contribute to allopatric or sympatric speciation. It doesn't really matter. We're going to talk about a couple of different examples of speciation real quick. The first is this Example that we see a Regulatus pominella, which if you've been reviewing old AP exams, you may have seen a question series on this. Regulatus pominella is a small fly that lives on hawthorn plants. Um, but with the importation of the apple into the new world uh, with the arrival of Europeans, one, uh, the Regulatus population is really split off into two different populations. One that reproduces on the hawthorn plant and one that reproduces on the apple plant. And they reproduce at different times of the year. They're not totally separate species. If we bring them back together in the environment, in the laboratory, they'll still reproduce with each other. But they, since they're living on different plants and their cycles are now timed for the flowering and fruiting of these different plants, they will never really encounter each other in the, in the wild. And so they're starting to evolve away from each other. That's one classic example of speciation sort of at work. Another really classic example is an example that was done in the lab. Um, so this is looking at Drosophila. And so what was done in this lab was that the Drosophila population was initially taken and split into two different populations and were fed different growth media. One that where starch was the main sugar source and one where maltose was the main sugar source. This was then allowed to continue for a series of generations. And then after they were brought back together, they did not reproduce with each other. Uh, the different populations did not reproduce with each other. They preferentially preferred to reproduce with members of their own population. You could still get them to reproduce with each other if it was like the only option available, but they showed pre they showed preference they showed preference in their mating to be restricted to only the population that they had evolved in. Right? Another example of speciation in action. Um, just two two quick examples to have in your back pocket, and like I said, really good idea to get more examples as well. We also talk about the idea of speciation through time. So, um, you know, how do we see all of these species that we've gone out and, and developed in the environment? Are they the product of what we would call gradualism, right? Which is many different small changes over time leading to production of new species. Or are they the product of punctuated equilibrium where we have long periods of time where there's no change in the species and then a relatively rapid series of a lot of changes leading to the speciation event followed by other long periods of time. Both are supported in the fossil record in different ways. And really it's just a matter of sort of your scale. So I wouldn't get bogged down in which one is accurate, right? Which one is correct. I would just have a good handle on both of them. Cool, speciation. We're gonna finish up here by talking about the origin of life on earth and the history of life on earth. And so let's, uh, let's dive in here. So how did we get to now, 
right? Well, we start with our Big Bang, and how do we wind up now? We're talking about about 13.7 billion years of evolution with uh, of evolution of the universe, with the Earth forming about four and a half billion years ago. Here is a clock graph of the evolutionary history of life on Earth, and we can see that life starts relatively early in the history of life on Earth. We start to see evidence about four billion years ago, give or take a couple hundred million. Um, but you can also see that we see a real up to, a real exponential increase in the diversity of life as we get closer to now, right? So we don't see a lot of diversity of life until about 540 million years ago. And then we see this massive change in the amount of life that we see on the planet. Let's look at the, at the origin of life first. So let's be very clear. These are all hypothetical things. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so bold as to call this a theory just yet. Um, but we need really four things to happen in order to get life. You need to have the biological molecules that we see in living things um, originate. Those then need to be encapsulated inside of cells. We need to get some sort of information storage and transmission. And then we need to, of course, get reproduction. So we'll go through each one in turn. Origin of biological molecules, kind of the simplest step, quote unquote, right? And um, we know that biological molecules are just a smaller group of larger organic molecules. Methane is an organic molecule. Um, it's any molecule that has made out of carbon and hydrogen. Biological molecules are a very specific type of organic molecule. So this is an amino acid. This is glycine, what's called the simplest amino acid. It's one of 20 different types of biological molecules. And of course, these biological molecules are put together in certain ways. So glycine and other amino acids have to be connected by peptide bonds into these biological molecules, which we of course refer to as proteins, right? Here's one particular protein. So how do we get these biological molecules? Where do they come from? Well, there's a bunch of evidence that we use to support this. The first is that looking at non-terrestrial objects, we find a variety of organic compounds in the universe, just kind of chilling. So like this, this asteroid was actually analyzed for what was coming off of it. And it was found to contain at least 16 different organic compounds, including that amino acid glycine. So even though it's probably not the product of some sort of biological system that put it into this asteroid, which has been you know, circulating around the universe for billions of years, it still forms in universal conditions. Sort of the classic example of this is the Miller-Urey experiment where they simulated what they thought were the conditions of early Earth at the time. So at this point, they put some gases that they thought were present, simple gases, and they used a spark to, to uh, simulate lightning, and they used a water basin to simulate the ocean, and they just circulated it and circulated it for a period of time, about a week. And then they isolated the compounds that were found inside of it. And what they found by doing this was they found that they were able to inorganically produce, right, or non-biologically produce amino acids like glycine, alanine, and aspartic acid, and a variety of other organic precursor compounds. So this helps to support the idea that you don't need biological systems for the production of organic molecules. Now, the, the Miller-Urey experiment itself is not actually early Earth, right? But these kinds of experiments have been done in a variety of different hypothetical origin circumstances, and they've produced a variety of different types of biological molecules. The point here is that there's really nothing special about biological molecules in terms of how they're made, and that given the right conditions, we can absolutely get the production of biological molecules. The next step, of course, is the origin of cells, right? The origin of cellular life. Um, we need to put all these molecules into compartments, which we call cells. We get evidence for that in the fossil record. So we have evidence for cellular life that dates back to at least about 4 billion years ago. Uh, we see evidence of stromatolites, which are structures that, as far as we know, are only built by cellular systems. We see other things in the fossil record as well. So we get things like, um, this is a stromatolite, uh, pardon me, we only, uh, the only evidence I have here is the stromatolite fossil, but you can go and look at other evidence in the fossil record for cellular life and the origin of cellular life, and you'll be taken on a wonderful tour of the internet. So uh, certainly enjoy if that's, uh, if that's what you're interested in doing. We also see things like biological organization. So encapsulating molecules inside of other biological molecules is not hard to do. We can do this spontaneously by putting lipids into water. You can get the kinds of structures that we see as the basis of cellular membranes. Some of you may have done this in your own 
uh, in your own classes and some of the labs that are done in class, right? But we can get all these things. Uh, certainly putting all the requirements for life into a compartment and getting it to become a fully functional cell has yet to be accomplished in the lab. But I mean, think about the history of life. It could have taken 100 million years to do it. We have plenty of time to do it. We, you know, here at working in our human time scale, it, we may not be able to just kind of get that kind of time in order to work the way that we want it to work. We have the origin of information storage molecules, right? So where do these things come from? We have evidence that supports this, like um, the, for instance, RNA molecules are able to not only store information, but can also carry out biological reactions. These are things which are known as ribozymes, which are enzymes that are based out of RNA. And this has led to this hypothetical notion of the RNA world, that the first living organisms on the planet may have used RNA as their genetic information because it could do double duty and also, and also catalyze some of the biological reactions that they needed. And then, of course, we have the origin of reproduction. So reproduction is a universal characteristic of life on Earth. Here are some cells reproducing. Here are some other organisms reproducing. Um, the evidence for this, you know, in my own slides, I have a question mark. It's not really a question mark. That's why I put the asterisk here. You can go and look on the Internet for evidence that supports the origins of reproduction. There is a lot of it, but... It's not something that we need to really bother ourselves with here for the purpose of this conversation, right? And I'll just point out that even though I'm not putting evidence here, that's not any sort of fatal flaw for these hypotheses. These hypotheses are by nature tentative. And so as a result, we're going to see, um, you know, evidence that develops and evidence that gets called into question going forward as this kind of conversation still happens. Let's wrap up here quickly with some brief conversation about the history of life on Earth. So how do you get from, you know, prokaryotic cells, cells that probably looked like modern day bacteria in many ways, to modern day organisms like the ones you see here in the Snapchat picture? Well, um, we're going to talk about a couple of different things. We're not going to go through the whole thing, all right? But we'll see um, a few things. So notice that life kind of shows up about 4 billion years ago in our thing. And we see the earliest start to photosynthesis about 3.2 billion years ago. How do we know that? We know that actually not only by finding fossils, right? So here's our stromatolite fossil again, which is about 3.5 billion years old. And we know that stromatolites in the modern era are built by photosynthetic bacteria. But we also see other structures in the environment as well. So we know that these are built by these bacteria. And that's the only way that we know these structures can be formed. Um, but we also know that probably the first organisms on the planet were heterotrophic, right? That they that they didn't carry out photosynthesis. In other words, photosynthesis had to evolve among life on the planet. And so how does this happen? Well, we know by looking at indicators of the amount of oxygen present in the environment when this may have happened. We can see the different stages of oxygen in this graph and we get geological evidence as well, specifically what are known as banded iron formations, which are deposits of iron that, as far as we can tell, had to come as a product of oxygenation of the environment. As the atmosphere oxygenated, the, the iron that was in the oceans was reacted with that oxygen and basically rusted out of the oceans, precipitated out, and formed these banded iron formations. This one's about 2.4 billion years old, right? So if we look at, go back to this history of life, sure, we see life about 4 billion years ago, and we don't see photosynthesis for almost a billion years. Now, looking at that timing, that's like the same amount of time between now and when there were basically only single-celled organisms on the planet, right? It's, it's a huge amount of time to go from just, you know, things that ate other things to the origins of photosynthesis on the planet. But that's a lot of biochemistry that has to get evolved, right? That's a lot of stuff that has to get figured out. And if we look at the entire history of life, we see it that first, basically, three quarters of life on Earth. Things have to get figured out that take a lot of time at the cellular level. Some of those things, right, photosynthesis, aerobic cellular respiration. We need to develop eukaryotes and compartmentalize in there. We need to evolve multicellularity. We need to evolve body plans for multicellular organisms. All of these things have to get figured out really before you have multicellular organisms in the fossil record. But we see that in that last billion years of life on Earth. So let's look at one other example here, which is the development of eukaryotes, right? Which we can see happens about uh, 2.25 billion years ago. Again, don't worry about these dates. They're total approximations. But we have a lot of evidence about the development of eukaryotes. And that's this notion of endosymbiosis. So endosymbiosis is a theory which says that we start with an ancient anaerobic prokaryote, right, um, that eats other things. 
And so maybe one of the first organisms that it ate was another prokaryotic. Let's back up. And so maybe over the course of its, you know, millions of years of life, it eats another organism that is an aerobic respirer, an aerobically respiring prokaryote. And rather than digesting it, instead, that aerobic prokaryote gives rise to the modern day mitochondrion, right? And then we get this modern aerobic eukaryote. Maybe this continues again, and we see the same kind of process, this, this swallowing of a photosynthetic prokaryote, like a cyanobacteria. And over time, this gives rise to the chloroplasts as well. So this is this notion of how we get eukaryotic organisms, this idea of endosymbiosis and the swallowing or the incorporation of free living prokaryotes that had developed aerobic cellular respiration and photosynthesis into other free living anaerobic cellular organisms, giving rise to the modern day eukaryotes with their modern day mitochondria and chloroplasts. Of course, I mean, we need to have evidence to support this kind of really crazy notion. Um, and we have a lot of different evidence that supports this. So the first is that there are uh, similarities between prokaryotes and mitochondria and chloroplasts. We know this because uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts both have their own mitochondrial chromosome. And we can actually look at the sequences on it and then compare it to all the bacteria that we see. And we can see that the chloroplast genome is unsurprisingly uh, most similar to certain species of cyanobacteria. And the mitochondrion genome is most similar to certain species of proteobacteria. We know, of course, that these organelles reproduce on their own, separate from the rest of the cell. Um, they have their own ribosomes. The fact that their chromosomes are circular is similar to how prokaryotic chromosomes are set up and not to eukaryotes who have linear chromosomes. All of this evidence together helps uh, to inform our notion of endosymbiosis. And so if we go back and we look at the early history of life, it's probably not so much that you start with one universal common ancestor that branches off, but really that you start with that universal common ancestor and it starts to branch off, but then we get exchanges between the different lineages of life. They could be exchanging entire bodies in the case of endosymbiosis. They could be exchanging segments of DNA among each other. And so we get this really interesting thing that's happening, but it's happening at the microscopic scale, right? It's happening at a level where we don't see it, but it probably takes a long time to get these things to happen. Of course, once life is set up, we see other things in the history of life as well. We see periodic mass extinctions where we see large numbers of organisms dying off in the fossil record, like our friends the trilobites from, uh, from a while ago now in our conversation. Events like ma massive asteroids hitting the planet, um, things like that, leading to a reduction in the number of phyla of organisms that we see on the planet. In this graph, you can see extinction intensity on the left-hand side, so the higher the peak, the more, um, the more intense that extinction event would have been. But also if we look at biodiversity over the fossil record, we can see that the total number of different phyla over time are increasing. And that's what we would expect to see if we're seeing this accelerated returns in the history of life on Earth. We see other things looking at this too. We get this idea when we have a lot of available niches and maybe after something like an asteroid hitting the planet, we see rapid divergence. It's geologically rapid, right? It's occurring over the span of a couple of millions of years. But in the geological time sense, we see these rapid divergences. So for instance, we get mammals that really diverge after the Cretaceous, after the dinosaurs were largely removed. Um, and we see uh, Darwin's finches, for instance, doing the same thing to kind of call back to other things. And of course, the, the, the other question that you're probably going to be asked to consider in certain ways, the more in the ecology ways, is what, what's this going to look like in the future? Right now that we're in the sort of this new, bi this new biological age where humans are having this massive effect on killing off all of these species. I like this graph, right? Look at the large mammals dying off after the entry of Homo sapiens onto all of these continents. You know, what are how are we now affecting the continuing life uh, on Earth? Yeah, cool. Almost done here. Just one last question, which was what is the most interesting example of a creature that has evolved to fit its environment? Man, I could really, it's hard to pick one. I, this is not my favorite, but it's one that I'll go with here at the end as sort of a, a bonus for you guys for paying attention here at the end. All right, so this is the pearl fish. I don't know how much of you guys know about the pearlfish, but the pearlfish lives a very interesting life. Um, they live inside of other organisms. So for instance, there are many species of pearlfish that live inside of the anus 
Oh, sea cucumbers. So sea cucumbers are an echinoderm. They actually have a structure inside of their anus that they use to respire. It's called a respiratory tree. And the pearlfish actually lives inside of it and basically eats the respiratory tree. It's not a big deal for the sea cucumber. It regrows it. It's kind of a commensal relationship. But I think that's kind of an interesting example of a creature that's evolved to fit its environment, right? This fish that has evolved specifically to live inside of the anus of another organism and eat its respiratory structure. And of course, in the grand cosmic hilarious scheme of things, this organism that lives inside of the butt of another organism is in the genus Carapace. So anyway, um, that's it, man. That's the end of our little chat. So we're gonna pause here and I'm gonna go and pull up the Google Doc and just see if any questions have been added to it. Bear with me, I know nothing more fun than this. I know, loading is super fun. Cool, not too many. How do you draw a phylogenetic tree using a character trait chart? Um, so for, uh, 315 ist. Um, I would point you to a couple of different places right now to get your answer for that. Um, you might want to go and check in at the um, on the question submission form. Submit that question so that it can be dealt with either during quantitative skills or during uh, difficult topics or at the end during the test taking tips. There's going to be some time there to kind of clean that one up as well. Any of those would work. Um, you can totally submit your question there. I feel like we've kind of gone on too long here to really do that. The other thing, of course, is that you can hit me up on Twitter or you can get my email, right? You see it on the info field. Feel free to, to write in or leave it in the comments and I'll, I'll point you towards some resources where you can learn what you need to do in order to figure this out. It's not hard to do and you definitely can figure it out. Um, I guess that's the only lingering question that we have. So I'm going to wrap this doc here and we'll talk just a couple of brief questions or comments that you might have. So um, the first, of course, is that please continue to review. Make use of the resources that I pointed you to in the info field. Continue to submit questions on the question submission form for people in the other sessions. Um, you can always get in touch with me or any of the other presenters as this goes on, all right? We definitely wanna be here to help you guys out. And uh, yeah, all right, so an hour and 20. All of evolution in an hour and 20. I'm sure it was incredibly fast, but remember, you can always replay it and you can slow it down during the replay. Thanks guys, I really appreciate it. I hope it was uh, useful for you. And if you have any questions or comments or concerns or complaints, don't hesitate to send them along. All right, so uh, thanks so much. I'm gonna stop the stream right now. Have a great day and good luck on the exam.